I, uh, I practiced this in front of my colleagues yesterday, and I got a bit emotional. Um, but that's not going to happen today in front of a room full of strangers. Um, so <laughs> really, this, is, this talks a, a lot about my experience as a gay man. Um, it doesn't apply to all gay men out there, uh, but certainly there's lessons to be learned. And hopefully, you'll all have something to take away from this. Uh, so I, uh, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm, I may use language that you may disagree with. Uh, probably the main one is I'm going to use the word gay a lot, and I'm going to use that uh, normally to describe uh, gay men. Um, but you should be able to make it out uh, from the context. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm from Belfast, and I left Belfast uh, as soon as I could. So that was <laughs> as soon as I turned 18, I finished... Uh, my high school education, and I moved to England for uh, university. And uh, after that, I moved to London, and I've lived in London ever since. Um, and you know, London's an London's a interesting place. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get on to that. But one thing that's important to know is that uh, queer migration is a thing. It happens. And you might be looking at me, you know, as you, you might look at me and think, well, uh, I'm, I'm a white male. I, I've got a lot of privilege in my life, and it's absolutely true. There are a lot of things that I'm privileged for. Uh, but gay men especially go through a hell of a lot. Not all of them, as I said, but, uh, for example, with queer migration, the Ireland to London route is particularly popular. So gay people grow up uh, with a childhood of negative emotion. They've got a secret. They often feel they have to hide that from everybody. They can't let anybody into their life. So for me, uh, I knew I was gay from maybe eight or nine years old. And from my early teenage years, I knew I had to leave Belfast. In fact, it's a place that until recently I, I find it difficult to call it home. People would say to me, oh, well, when are you going to visit home next? And I would say, that was never my home. So it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult time for gay men. Um, obviously, you might have understanding parents, and you might feel that you can come out and, and let them know who you really are. But for a lot of people, that's not an option. And in Ireland particularly, we've, we're making strides. So for example, a gay marriage is, is not okay here, not in the North, but um, things are changing, things are improving. Certainly 15 years ago, uh, when I left, it was, it was not okay. Uh, being gay was very, very difficult. Um, so uh, yeah, I left. And I think that's, that's something that whenever you meet anybody who says they're gay, you've got to remember that they've had this period of their life which has been chaos, mentally, emotionally. They've had to put up with a secret that you know, maybe they felt ashamed, um, maybe they felt that they, they wanted to escape. So another part of my life has been software. Maybe it was a little bit of escapism, but from a very early age I got interested in computers. Uh, I started playing video games, uh, and, and from that I started thinking about how are they built. And uh, I started making my own little games, and software has been my life ever since then. Uh, and one of the things when I started my career as a professional software developer, one of the things I got interested in was the quality of code, making a better product. How do we build the best software that we can? How do we build the, the products that our clients really want? And that was a hard thing for uh, the industry for a long while. We were pretty good at failing. Right? We delivered things over budget. Over time, things didn't work. They didn't do what they advertised. And that's how I got involved in a movement called craftsmanship. And that's why my job title is software crafter. I'm actually a developer. I write a lot of code. But a lot of my job is also uh, teaching, training, trying to get the word out about how to build better software. And recently, uh, I realized that actually a lot of those battles have been solved. We are doing better as an industry in terms of the quality of code we're writing but there are still a lot of things that we need to solve in the industry. So for me, craftsmanship has come to mean more than just the code. And that's why I'm here today. It's the first time I've talked about uh, being gay, um, and it's something I'm hoping to do more of, because I think it is one of the things that we don't talk about enough. And even if we, if we look at the talks today, not many men coming up here and speaking about it. So gay men kind of exist in this weird space where we can be taken to be part of the dominant social group. You, you'd look at me, you'd meet at me, you wouldn't know that I was gay until I tell you that. And that's, that's one of the, the choices that we have to make all the time. Are we going to come out? 
And of course, we're used to not doing that because we spent our childhood not coming out. We spent our childhood hidden. So we're very good at hiding. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we, we don't. And so the first thing I would say is you've got to accept that you're a member of a marginalized group. You've got to know that there are things in your life which are not okay. It's very easy to start your professional career and act like a straight white male. It's very easy to fit in. Obviously, it's going to make your life, life easier. You're going to have an easier time if you pretend, right? Well, on the surface, that might be true. And I can completely see that that's a valid choice for a lot of people. So a lot of people choose not to come out. In fact, over half of the LGBT population has chosen not to come out fully at work. So we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, addressing the fears that people have about why they might not want to come out. Um, for example, in 29 of the US states, you can still be fired for being gay. Uh, and, and a statistic I read just this morning uh, was that men who identify themselves as having same-sex attractions may make 68% the amount of their straight counterparts. So there's a pay gap. I didn't actually realize that today. I'm going to have to go back and talk to my boss about that. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I can understand why people don't want to come out. But accepting you're a member of a minority is a different thing. It's a mindset. And I think it's very important that we recognize that we have struggles that we still need to, to solve. Another thing that you see a lot of is people come out and they have a relatively OK life. They, uh, they're doing OK. You know? they, maybe they've got their own flat. They have a boyfriend. Things are all right at work. And they forget about it. And they don't see themselves as having issues. And so uh, that's another reason why you don't see people at events like this, because they're kind of content. They're happy with their lot. So one of the things that strike, uh, strikes me a lot is uh, when, when I see gay men move to London and they get lost in the gay scene. And I don't think this is said enough. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of our first community, first community feel that we might have. So we've had this uh, childhood, we've had this life where we haven't belonged. We've never felt that belonging. And suddenly we move somewhere where there is a gay community. And generally it's called the gay scene. And it's not a very healthy place. That's the sad truth of it. And very few people say this. Very few people are happy to criticize or try to fix the problems in the gay scene. Um, but it's a place which makes people very isolated. Uh, people become very insecure. They suffer rejection. If you don't fit a, a stereotype, you will, uh, you'll face rejection. So people are forced to look a certain way if they want to fit in. And of course, fitting in is something they want to do. They don't want to go back to their past. That's a terrible time of their lives. They don't want to be back there, so they want to fit in. And what you see is a lot of gay men uh, getting into this cycle of work, gym, partying, drugs. You see a lot of people with steroid addictions or a lot of people getting into very hard, serious drugs uh, like crystal meth, which, you know, th I, I think I was lucky being a bit of a geek. I would always read things before I got involved in them. And so, <laughs> you know, I would go to the internet and I would say, well, what's this crystal meth? You know, and, but not everybody's like that. And so it, it's, you can't be, the thing about it is, is that people are ignorant to these things. And then they go out to the communities and they meet people in clubs that don't have their best interests at heart. So it can be a very difficult place to, to live uh, when you're involved in the gay scene. Um, you know, for, for me, I think one of the big things for me is when I, when I grew my hair long. And uh, that's, a, that's an absolute no-no. Do not have long hair if you're a gay man. The number of times I've, somebody came up to me at a bar and said, well, cut your hair and I'll fuck you. And for me, it's not that it bothered me. Uh, it's just you know, I, it's, it's kind of nice to, to, to have a, a, an aspect of myself where I can say, well, you know, actually, I'm not part of this gay scene. I think it's so important to uh, be yourself. It's so important to know who you are. And it's so important to remember that we are really aiming to have a healthy life, a productive life, a happy life. And there, the problems that we have in the gay scene are not insurmountable, but they are there. Um, one of the things... 
we probably struggle with most at the moment is hookup apps. People are very, people are getting into this idea that it's okay to be on your phone, you know, scrolling through and looking for hookups, uh, and 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 not leaving your house, not going out into the community. Of course, that's killed a lot of the, the gay community. A lot of businesses are shutting down, and those owners might sometimes blame these hookup apps. Um, and so there's this kind of, again, cycle of insecurity, that uh, isolation, that, 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 that kind of feeds into the psyche of gay men. It's, it's not a healthy thing, unfortunately. So if you, th thankfully we have a solution to that as technology practitioners. Whatever our jobs are, we fit in an industry which is actually very introspective and wants to solve its problems. And, and its heart is full of good-natured people. So my advice is really that you center yourself there. It's fine to be gay, it's fine to be part of that community, but don't make it your life because at the moment it has problems that you're not going to be able to, to solve, whereas the technology scene is a much healthier place to be. Probably the easiest way, and this has come up already today, is finding a mentor. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm part of the craftsmanship movement, and part of, the, part of that is about mentorship. We find mentors, we find apprentices, uh, and we base it off the kind of medieval craftsman practices. So we take on apprentices and we teach them what we do. And that's generally about technical work, but it applies to all areas of our life. And it, particularly with gay men, it can be difficult to find role models. Uh, when we leave home, as we do, you know, we flee the nest, we find those urban centers where gay people are accepted, we're leaving behind our parents. And for, for straight people, parents are our first role models. We can look to our parents to teach us how to, well, how to parent, how to have a loving adult relationship. And so for the people who've left that behind, we've severed that relationship. We no longer have those first role models. And we go to places like London and we're, we're, we're alone. There's nobody we can look up to. It's actually very hard to meet people of the older generations who have been through what we've been through uh, and have made a success of their lives. You're not going to find it in the gay clubs. You're probably not also going to find uh, many gay men in your, work, uh, in your work environments. But it's so important that we look for them. So go to meetups, go to conferences like this and meet people that you respect, that you think could add value to your lives, and follow them, talk to them, spend time with them. My first job was uh, at a kind of medium-sized company. And uh, I, I, had, I had spent some time at university as president of the LGB Society. So I had put that on my CV when I applied for that job. I thought, well, this is kind of an impressive thing. You know, I'd managed a student organization. And I, when I arrived, the first day of the first job, it was all fine. I started with two other graduates. And by the end of the first week, I had this feeling that everybody there knew that I was gay. And I didn't really, I didn't really understand how this has happened. So over a drink one night with my uh, boss at the time, uh, he told me, uh, oh, well, uh, one of the guys who interviewed you, he, he read it on your CV that you were gay. And uh, so he, he told me, he said, um, oh, we've got three new graduates starting, and by the way, one of them's gay. <laughs> and my boss said, well, you can't really tell me that. And he said, well, it's fine. We talked about our interview, and it's fine. He's happy with it. And he's right. You know, I was happy with it, but at some point, I kind of wanted to be the one to come out with myself. And so when I started that company, everybody knew that one of these three graduates was gay. And by the end of the week, they'd figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> so, you know, that was fine. Actually, I had a good relationship with everybody in that company. Um, it, it, wasn't a, 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 it really wasn't a, a, an issue at all. Um, but, you know, little things like that can make all the difference to gay people. One of the best environments I think you can be is in a large company. So companies like Amazon, and Google, uh, the, you know, IBM, they have special schemes for... Uh, diversity. So gay groups are often uh, ones which have a lot of support. And that works in big companies because they no longer have to solve the little issues of their business. They don't have to figure out 
how they're going to stay successful. They've done that. They have a successful business model. They're not really going to fail unless they do something really wrong. So they can look at other issues. They can look at the social issues. So they're actually very safe places to come out. And uh, another job I had, I didn't come out in, until you know, three years into that job uh, at a very big company. And actually, looking back at it, I should have. Although I felt you know, a lot of pressure to conform and be part of the corporate image, actually the structures of that company, the structure they had in place would have protected me. They would never have let me be uh, harassed. You know, I wouldn't have been fired for being gay because of the structures that were in place. So large companies are fantastic places to be gay. Smaller companies, uh, well, I'm part of a smaller company now, and what I'd say is you really have a huge, huge uh, array of companies out there, and lots of them have different cultures. You should choose one with an inclusive culture, one that celebrates difference. And you can see that when you go for interview. You shouldn't feel the need to fit in to the wrong culture. And when I, when I first started public speaking, I remember I gave a talk um, about you know, how you should be wanting to build quality software with pair programming and test-driven development. And somebody asked the question, well, you know what if my boss doesn't believe in pair programming? And I said, well, find a new job. And for a while, I thought, oh, well, that was a terrible answer. And I didn't ever really say that again. But lately, I've been thinking, no, it's the right answer. We don't, you know, no matter who, who you are, no matter what your skill level, there are always better companies out there if you look hard enough. We shouldn't have to settle for these companies which aren't where we can be happy. And of course, another thing you can do is uh, do your own thing. Companies like Kickstarter and Indiegogo show us that it's possible to start your own business. It's actually much easier than you'd think. I haven't done it, but I've got friends who you know, are constantly saying, oh, you should, go and, you should go and do this. They're doing fun things. They're doing things for themselves things that make an, uh, an effect in their lives. So this has uh, come up already today, and it's, it's great to see this, uh, that this is a common theme. So I'm using technologist here to mean somebody who naively believes that all technology is good. And this is, this is the norm in our industry. You can, you can look at, for example, I talked about um, hookup apps earlier. Well, you know, a lot of gay men just think, well, this is okay. I'm going to get on this and start using it. And they don't even think about the impact it has on their lives. And it has a huge impact. And when we think about technology and the way it's developed over time, uh, first of all, machines were uh, you know, a military invention, a government invention. And then they progressed into a business tool. Uh, and now we kind of have social apps. This is kind of a new thing. People haven't really come to, to accept the idea that they permeate our lives, they're everything, and we can use them for social good. But it's super important that, that as a minority group, we think about this. So for example, Grindr, which is one of the hookup apps that I mentioned, they have uh, recently they ran a Grindr for Equality program, which uh, sent messages to their users about which uh, local political representatives supported LGBT rights. So they were kind of using their app to do a little bit of what they thought was social good. And up, they've got an upcoming uh, event called Hack for Equality, which is a hackathon based on the data that they, they have, again, about uh, promoting the idea of uh, adding social benefit to gay communities. And we can look at companies like Facebook, which has been criticized in the past for some of the policies it's adopted. But, for example, it's real name policy. But, you know, they make a huge effort now to do the right thing. So just this morning I read about... Uh, how they are trying to, uh, they're developing an algorithm to cut out clickbait al articles because they recognize that people don't want to see these. So Facebook has a huge uh, investment in doing things for social good. And that's the kind of idea about technologism. You do not need to just apply technology wherever it doesn't make sense. And a lot of the people around us don't understand technology. And I think when you're part of a marginalized group, and you accept that you are, you should tell people when the technology they use has an effect that they don't understand. You should be happy to point out, point out to them what effects hookup, hookup apps have or what effects other parts of technology have. It's okay to have an opinion about technology. Too often we think, well, you should just try everything new and everything's great, but we really need to stop and think about what effect it has 
on our community. So my last point is to talk about the superpower we have as gay men, uh, particularly if you're a white gay man like I am. You straddle this border. On one side, you've got the dominant social group. You've got the straight white males. And on the other side, you've got all the marginalized groups in society. You have a lot of uh, empathy for both sides, of course. Um, these, the, part, the people in the dominant social group listen to you. They're biased to listen to you, right? They, they've got these intrinsic things that, you know, you feel included part of their group. They feel you're part of them. They will listen to you more than they'll listen to the other groups. So you, but at the same time, you are part of a marginalized group. It's almost like you have a moral duty to stick up for these people and help them whenever uh, they need your help. And I think gay men particularly need to be told this because sometimes they forget. Maybe they want to hide. They don't want to come out because of their fear. Or perhaps it's because they've come out and their life's OK. They're happy. They want to go and enjoy themselves in the clubs, on the gay scene. They want to just have a good time. They've, had, they've suffered too much in their childhoods. They just want to have a good time. And what I'm saying to you is, well, no, you need to stick up for everybody in our society who hasn't got those benefits of, uh, of, your, of the gay community. And that's it, so thanks. <laughs>